Good afternoon and welcome back to the Wallace Stegner Center 26th Annual Symposium, The Plastics Paradox, Societal Boon or Environmental Bane. Our last session of the day will cover plastics and health. Uh, unfortunately, due to a family emergency, Monique Harden, who was the Assistant Director of Law and Policy at the Deep, Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, will be unable to join us today. So we will have our two panelists, but they are going to give wonderful presentations and we look forward to your questions. So on the note of questions, if you have questions for our speakers, please type them into the Q&A window by clicking the Q&A button on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We'll hear from both of our panelists today, and then there will be a joint question and answer session. They have full biographies in the materials, so I will give each of them a brief introduction right before they speak. So our first speaker uh, for this panel will be Dr. Carmen Masurlian, who is the Assistant Professor of Environmental Reproductive Prenatal and Pediatric Epidemiology in the Departments of Epidemiology and Environmental Health. She's also the Director of Scientific Early Life Environmental Health and Development Program at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So, Dr. Masurlian, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Robin, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so kindly for the invitation to speak at your 26th annual symposium, The Plastics Paradox, Societal Boon or Environmental Bane. Again, I'm Carmen Masterlian, and I'm a professor of environmental reproductive epidemiology at Harvard University. And I hope that by the end of this presentation or lecture, that from a perspective of a reproductive epidemiologist, I will convince you that the plastic paradox is really truly an environmental bane from across the reproductive life course. So I'm gonna turn off my video now so I can continue my presentation. We live in an increasingly more complex chemical world. The chemical industry is a multi-trillion dollar business. In 2016, the sales of synthetic chemicals around the globe exceeded 3 trillion US dollars. There are more than 83,000 chemicals in production today with more than 2,700 of these chemicals considered high production volume chemicals, meaning that they're produced in excess of 1 million kilograms per year. However, the most surprising and worrying aspect of this, aside from the pervasive nature of production and sales of these chemicals, is that many of these chemicals that are used in the direct application or production of plastics have not been tested for safety. So the vast majority of these chemicals, many of which are used in the direct application production of plastics, have never been tested for safety. A recent analysis of all plastic ever made estimates that the global production of plastics has increased from 2 million metric tons in 1950 to 380 million metric tons in 2015. I'm not sure if this slide has been used in a prior lecture over the course of the day, but it might have been. Nevertheless, I repeat it here to, to uh, accentuate the, the vast exponential growth of plastics across the globe. So by the end of 2015, 8,300 million metric tons of virgin plastic has been produced. Significantly, roughly two thirds of all plastics ever produced has been released into the environment and remains there in some form today as debris in the oceans, as micro or nanoplastics in air and agricultural soils, as microfibers in water supplies, or even as microparticles inside the human body. More than half of all plastic ever created was produced in the last 15 years, which is poised to accelerate in production even further, driven by the boom in, of inexpensive shale gas from fracking, which has made the primary feedstocks for plastic cheap and abundant. This must not be any news to anyone attending this conference, but based on the current projection, the production of plastic will increase by 35% to approximately one 100 million metric tons by 2025. That is a sobering fact. But why should we care about plastics and the chemicals that are in our environment? Well, if we care about our children and our future generations, then we should care about the environment and how plastics impact 
human reproductive health. And here are some headlines from major media outlets over the last month. So microplastics found in children's bodies, um, chemicals found in our bodies might be leading us to our extinction. Pollution is causing penises to shrink and sperm rates to plummet. This is by Shauna Swan's recent work uh, in a book that she just published, getting a lot of media attention. Plastic particles pass from mother into fetuses, rat study shows. This is just in the last month. If you continue to peruse uh, Google, you will find weekly such coverage from the impact um, of plastic and chemicals in our bodies and how they harm human health. So the NIEHS, which is the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences Children's Environmental Research Center published an impact report in 2017. This report serves as a compelling reminder and should motivate all of us to consider the short and long-term impact that plastics has on children's health. And I want to emphasize the word plastics here. Plastics is really uh, uh, more so than just plastics. We're talking about chemicals in the environment because the production of plastics results in an abundant of chemical classes to be released into our environment, both long acting chemicals, chemicals that stay in our body for a long time, as well as short acting chemicals. Um, so listed here are just a few examples of the consequences that should concern everyone in public health, in public policy, and in environmental law and advocacy. So approximately 16,000 preterm births in the United States are attributable to air pollution. Air pollution, much of which is caused by fossil fuels and is used in the chain of plastics production. Children in 4 million households may be exposed to high levels of lead. Once thought to be primarily a genetically driven disorder, it is now well established that gene and environment interactions contribute to autism and the spectrum of disorders under its umbrella. Children in the United States and across the globe remain at high risk for adverse outcomes and our environment remains an important yet incompletely understood determinant of these outcomes. Beyond the individual and family, however, children's environmental health has significant cost to society. The socioeconomic burden of environmentally related diseases in US children is estimated to be over $76 billion annually. So what kinds of chemicals concern us? Those that have been shown in experimental or human studies to perturb one or more aspect of the endocrine system. And the Endocrine Society of the United States broadly defines endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs as exogenous chemicals or mixtures of these chemicals that can interfere with any aspect of hormone action. And EDCs are the hundreds or more chemicals that can be found in our environment, in our food, in our consumer products that interfere with hormonal synthesis, metabolism or action resulting in dysregulation and disruption of this hormonal homeostasis. And there are more than 800 chemicals that have been identified as known or potential endocrine disruptors to date. However, many, many more have uh, exist but have yet to be tested. So really this is the tip of the iceberg. And again, the message here is that, that plastics production results in, a, in an abundant of these chemicals to be released into our environment and found again in our environment through food, consumer products, et cetera. So what are some of the key examples of these EDCs that have been identified as toxic, this tip of the iceberg? Really, there's been a few classes that have received attention and two of the biggest classes that have received attention from both a, a toxicological and an epidemiological point of view considered as bad actors are what we call phthalates and phenols, two large chemical groups found in the production of plastic and the use of the uh, application of plastic production. So phthalates um, can include high molecular weight phthalates, which can be found in medical devices and toys. So in the plastic production of uh, IV tubing, for example, um, we find high molecular weights, phthalates in toy production, plastic toy production, we find these phthalates. Low molecular weight phthalates are more found in adhesive and paints uh, and personal care products, again, in the production of these products. BPA or bisphenol A, we find commonly in plastic bottles, in food packaging that's lined with plastic, and in toys as well. Both of these chemical groups have received substantial uh, attention over the last five or 10 years from an, epi from an epidemiological as well as a toxicological point of view. And there is an abundance of data now showing the harms these chemicals pose to human health. However, beyond single chemicals or single chemical groups, we are actually exposed to a plethora of mixtures of chemicals for which our understanding of their harm is really limited. We haven't studied chemical mixtures and that is more of a real 
uh, world scenario of our exposures uh, in, in the human body. So one of the key points that I would like for you to take away from this talk is that our, our understanding as scientists, both epidemiologists and toxicologists, again, is that these chemical groups are initially considered as endocrine disruptive. However, they're actually broader than that. Their health impact is broader, broader than that. And we know that they're epigenetic toxic, they're immunotoxic, they're neurotoxic, they're obesogenic. There's a, there's a, 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 these classes of chemicals impact more than just the endocrine system. They impact many different systems and organ systems in the human body. And our, um, our understanding of this impact is really still at its infancy. We can broadly categorize these EDCs, and I'm using EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals, as, as, a, as a, just as a, co a common term, even though it's beyond the endocrine system, how these chemicals impact human health. But just for simplicity, I call them EDCs. So we look at these in two groups. So the short-lived chemicals and the long, longer-lived uh, persistent chemicals. So the persistent chemicals tend to stick around for a long time in the environment and in our bodies. And these can include things like flame retardants and PCBs, um, which are used in electronics and building materials, including plastic production and perfluorinated chemicals such as PFOA or C8, which is used in the production of Teflon coating in pans, for example. Um, Non-persistent chemicals, again, like the ones that I just mentioned, like BPA and phthalates, parabens and triclosans, all are short-lived chemicals, meaning they're metabolized fairly quickly in our body in hours or days. But the problem with the short-lived chemicals is that we are constantly exposed to these non-persistent chemicals throughout the day. So that despite the fact that they are metabolized quite quickly, we are just as soon re-exposed through our food, through our personal care products, through cosmetics, through other sources. So exposure is chronic yet episodic. Okay, so um, how do these chemicals get into our bodies? Um, there are many different sources of exposure to these chemicals, and each source has different roots of exposure. And this is um, both environment and chemical specific. So we know there's the oral exposure, so through food contamination, plasticizers, um, inhalation through dust and, and plastics that are found in the dust and broken down, transfer through uh, a mother's body into her breast milk, transfer through a mother to her fetus through amniotic fluid in the placenta, as well as dermal exposure when we use cosmetics, deodorants, shampoos, and perfumes. Okay, so here are some quick facts about phthalates. I'm not going to go so much into bisphenol A or phenols. So phthalates are a large class of chemicals with diverse industrial and consumer application. They've been around since the 1920s. Currently, global production of phthalates exceeds 3 billion kilograms per year. And there are definitely more than 20 different phthalate compounds on the market today. And some of these compounds, such as diethylhexyl phthalate or DEHP, are used to soften plastic, and they can be found virtually everywhere in many different kinds of plastic containing products, both consumer and industrial, including things made out of polyvinyl chloride or PVC. Other phthalate compounds, as I mentioned, are solvents and they can be really good at binding scent and color to products. And so sometimes they're added to, to cosmetics, perfumes and personal care products. Again, um, quite commonly found in these products. Um, okay, so Moving on to one particular phthalate that really, really concerns us is found in a polyvinyl chloride and plastic production. And this is called diethylhexyl phthalate or DHP. And this compound, um, again, is used to make plastics more durable and flexible. And diet is considered a major source of exposure to DEHP. Why? Because during the manufacturing process, food becomes contaminated with phthalates. So in these pictures, you could see uh, typical food processing plants where you find PVC tubing and conveyor belts virtually everywhere on every single step of food production. So the most common route of exposure to these DHP chemicals really occurs through the ingestion of food and beverages contaminated with DHP because it's not covalently bond to the plastic during the processing of food. So before you even get your food in your home, the food has already been grossly contaminated with this very reproductive toxicant called a uh, chemical called DEHP. So what do we know about these chemicals and why do we care about how they impact reproductive health? We know that healthy reproduction requires very complex hormonal processes to work in synchrony. And given their potential to disrupt hormonal homeostasis, these chemicals, including DHP, alters critical pathways that are required to achieve conception, maintain pregnancy, and deliver healthy offspring. 
There's ample toxicological evidence that shows that some EDCs are reproductive, neurological, and epigenetic toxic, and many are also teratogenic and obesogenic. There is an accumulating epidemiological evidence linking these EDCs, including DEHP, to adverse reproductive and developmental outcomes widely across the life course. And one particular gap in our understanding is the timing of exposure, which is considered a very critical determinant of disease susceptibility. So different periods in the developmental life course are more or less susceptible to the effects of these EDCs. For example, embryogenesis very early on in the, in the embryo's development in, in the time of conception is governed by complex genetic and epigenetic mechanisms and exposure to this period, or perhaps even before conception during gametogenesis when your sperm and eggs are formed, may be the critical window during which things like DHP may alter um, their effect and increase the risk of specific adverse outcomes, including pregnancy loss. So the preconception window is really a critical window that I want to draw your attention to. And this is at the point of time before conception occurs. Most studies on these chemicals have really focused on exposure in pregnancy. And my key message in this talk is that really we need to modify behavior and reduce exposure prior to pregnancy in both men and women to increase the probability of a successful reproductive outcome. And there are really few studies that have looked at the preconception window as the critical window window of vulnerability. Um, some of my studies have done that. And I'll present to you very briefly one particular study. But another key message in this talk is that there's male mediated uh, toxicity that was first described by Olshan Fossman in 1993. And what I'm trying to convey here is that evolutionarily, it makes sense for the father's exposure during the preconception. So before conception, this information to be passed on to offspring. And we need to be really concerned about father's exposure, as well as a mother's exposure before pregnancy, because we do now have really um, significant data that's emerged showing that chemicals like DHP used in plastics production increases the risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, increases the risk of developmental problems in children, decreases um, a man's ability to conceive a healthy offspring and impacts a male's fertility. And we know this, that a male a sperm contains more than just 23 chromosomes, that actually male sperm carries an epigenetic cargo, including methylated DNA, non-coding RNAs, and other things that are critical to fertilization and early embryo programming. And there's really strong data now showing that chemicals like EDH, a DEHP actually impacts these steps like fertilization and early embryo programming. Other potential reproductive effects that have been identified through DHP exposure includes, um, for example, disrupted ovarian function and the inhibition of antral follicles in animals. That's in the female uh, rat and mouse. In male uh, mice, we find something called phthalate syndrome, which reduces anogenital distance. In dams that have been dosed during pregnancy, we find fewer litters, fewer live pups per litter, and a fewer number of pups born alive in a dose-dependent manner. So we know through experimental studies that these chemicals harm very directly reproductive health. There's also a very strong body of evidence that's being accumulated from a human side that shows prenatal exposure increases the risk of preterm birth, decreases birth weight, and results in other adverse pregnancy outcomes. And some of the work that I've been directly involved with has shown that periconception exposure around the time of conception in the cycle of conception reduces the number of mature oocytes, reduces ovarian reserve, decreases the rate of pregnancy and live birth, and increases the risk of miscarriage. One particular study, I'm almost done my, my talk for anyone wondering why I'm going quite a bit over here. Um, one particular study that I would like to draw your attention to is the study on pregnancy loss that I conducted in 27, 2016, published in the, in the Journal of Epidemiology. And pregnancy loss is a, is, is, is a major contributor to reduced fecundity or reduced fertility among couples trying to conceive. And this can be a devastating outcome for couples trying to get pregnant. Um, and something that concerns many, many couples achieving pregnancy or trying to achieve pregnancy. And we conducted a study that looked at 256 women and 303 pregnancies. I won't go into the details of the study, but you can look up the paper, email me if you want more information. But I'd like to point to you this particular uh, slide that shows the risk 
of biochemical pregnancy loss, which is a very early pregnancy loss by increasing quartiles of this chemical called DEHP. So we summed the concentration in the urine of women at the cycle of conception. And we found that with increasing quartiles, I don't know if you could see my little mouse, but quartile one, quartile two, quartile three, and quartile four, the risk of pregnancy loss went from 4% among the lowest exposed to 17% among the highest exposed to this chemical, women that were exposed to this chemical. And when we did um, sort of more fancier sort of statistical analysis, we found that the risk um, tripled among women in the in the highest exposed group compared to the lowest exposed group. And this was significant clinically because um, we found that there was a difference in outcomes of live birth. And this was also observed when we looked at total pregnancy loss. The risk was much higher among women that were highly exposed or exposed in the fourth quartile compared to the first quartile. Um, and the risk in increased by 60% among these women, which is not trivial. And this was loss up to 20 weeks gestation. So some of these losses occurred in the second trimester. So I'm gonna skip this slide and I'm gonna to go to my key messages. So plastic exposure should be broadened to include all chemical mixture exposure. We can't disentangle the production of one chemical to another in terms of how plastics produce. Plastics um, result in a plethora of chemical families ex um, exposed into the environment. And we know that exposure occurs across the reproductive life cycle and begins before pregnancy in the preconception period at the level of gametes. And we know that the adverse effect of these chemical exposures includes the endocrine system, but also the immune system, the neurological system, the epigenetic uh, markers on, on, our, on our genome and genetic and metabolic effects, all of which can harm human reproductive health at various stages of, of, product, of human uh, reproductive outcomes. And the prevention and reduction of exposure should include both members of the couple and begin before pregnancy to protect offspring health across the life course. And lastly, prevention and mitigation strategies are needed at all levels, including top-down policy-related ones, including as well as bottom-up education and awareness raising ones among members of the couples, uh, among couples as well as physicians treating and caring for women and couples. So with that, I will conclude by saying my work is uh, not just my own. It's the work of an amazing team of uh, colleagues and students that uh, work under my mentorship. And they're really the success behind the, the work that I've conducted and presented here today. And I also wanna thank um, my NIHS funding and others at the NIHS and CDC and the Massachusetts General Hospital. And a couple slides here, if people share the slides, is how we can decrease our exposure to phthalates, as well as possible sources of exposure to phthalates for your information. Lastly, anybody wants to talk more about this subject, I am happy to take your email at any point or even a phone call or text. So please be in touch and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Masurlian, for that uh, very informative and uh, more than a little scary presentation. Uh, we appreciate it very much, and we are already getting questions for after our second presenter, who is Dr. Scott M. Belcher, Professor of Biological Sciences at the Center for Human Health and the Environment at North Carolina State University. So, Dr. Belcher, the floor is yours. It's quite an honor to be invited here today, and it is the last scheduled talk of the day. So for that, I would actually like to, I, I prepared a talk that's just a little bit different here than this come before. I'm going to kind of go over some highlights of uh, kind of how we got here, some of the health effects, some of the research we've been doing. And then I want to offer a, uh, a case study of, of a real paradox with plastics um, that I that I put forth that is has become a, a major focus of my research uh, lately and a, and a big major um, health problem here in North Carolina. Um, and then I want to end with some putting forth some potential solutions um, that I've you know I've put together and these are essentially my own opinions, so I need to give the disclaimer, these do not represent the opinions of my university, they are mine, uh, but they've been drawn together of, uh, over 15 years of doing work with endocrine disruptors and plastic related chemicals, as well as uh, working uh, on, on, on international and national policy efforts. Um, so to dig right in, 
I'd like to start with actually the same slide that my, my colleague here at North Carolina State, Dr. Andrade used uh, earlier today, uh, but I wanted to put a different bent on this. This came from Life Magazine in uh, 1955, uh, highlighting the importance and all of the great benefits of our throwaway culture of how it's going to make household chores a thing of the past and this disposable lifestyle is going to become uh, uh, just such a, a boon to our, our Western existence. Uh, but reading a little bit deeper into this, this uh, uh, article, which is, is very short, plastics was never mentioned. There's absolutely no plastics mentioned throughout this article. It was all referring to paper and aluminum. Progressing to this film in 2009, which uh, was titled The Plastic Planet. It was by a director named Werner Boots. And um, what he did is actually went around and highlighted all the plastic products in people's homes. And as a matter of fact, um, my two-year-old daughter and all of her plastic toys were featured in this. And, and as you can see here, the entire house and all of these articles from, from our, our, our very modern and, and wonderful existence are just laid out there for everyone to see. Um, and it has become a complete way of life um, and not even addressing uh, the disposable uh, uh, plastics uh, that we're using every day. Thinking about health effects, um, since we have a very short amount of time, uh, I'd like actually to focus to this, the Center for Environmental, uh, the Center for International Environment Law that uh, pra uh, published um, this, the, this uh, collaborative effort with a number of NGOs in 2019, um, highlighting the health and, and, and costs of, of our current plastic planet. So there's much more information than I could possibly go into uh, today contained in that, but this is a, a great resource uh, that I've highlighted here with the URL for anybody that's interested. So thinking about uh, health, we're understanding now is a major part of, uh, of uh, how health occurs. It was this, this very uh, provocative cover from uh, 2010 on Time Magazine of how the first nine months shapes the rest of your life. And really what this is covering is this idea of this uh, preconceptual and in utero development um, has lifelong health effects that really leads to this idea um, of later in life adverse health effects during this period of time. And for today, thinking about plastic uh, and microplastics especially, I wanted to point out this article that was recently published from an Italian group that looked for evidence of microplastics in the placenta. Um, they actually titled this the uh, Plasticenta, the first evidence of microplastics in human placenta. And quite shockingly, what they found was looking only at six placenta, four of those six placenta, they found microplastic, multiple pieces of microplastic on both the maternal and the fetal side of the placenta. And I wanted to just leave you with this kind of rhetorical question about this. Is this experiment okay? Fundamentally, we absolutely know that Ethically, this is not a great experiment, but this is the experiment of our times. We are in the middle of an experiment that we do not understand the long-term and the final outcomes uh, on the health of humanity, frankly. Going back to the health effects, um, this figure two here uh, from the uh, IE or I C I E L. Uh, report on plastics and health uh, shows the multiple pathways that um, of exposures that are occurring uh, as a result of plastics uh, use. This includes extraction and um, uh, transport of natural resources with petroleum manufacturing, uh, the refining and the manufacturing of the plastics themselves. Uh, consumer use, which has been a major focus of uh, much of our research and, and many, many others, as well as waste management. 
Um, and for each of these steps, there is literally hundreds of individual toxic chemicals uh, through which people are exposed. And this includes, and we've covered it quite frequently today, inhalation and ingestion through air and water, skin contact for some of the consumer uses and some of the, the industrial and occupational uses, as well as um, uh, um, the use of some plastics um, and exposure through uh, skin contact in their use. One of the things that I wanna point out here is highlighted in this kind of sneaky red thing that says toxic recycling, a circular economy where we're actually reusing these chemicals does not alleviate all of the potential problems. In fact, there's increasing evidence that in some cases, recycling itself can increase the presence and the exposure to persistent chemicals, especially. Focusing on the areas where we've done most of our research and, and most of the research uh, to date largely um, that has been has really focused on this area of consumer use that I'm highlighting here. And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the, just in, in, in very big brushstrokes, some of the, the health issues that are related uh, to this and focusing on some of the endocrine disruptor, disruptor work that we've done. So one thing I wanna point out that polycarbonate plastic, water bottles, these are plastics. These plastics are actually not inert. Um, in fact, this is the polymer of polycarbonate, which is chains of bisphenol A linked together uh, through this polycarbonate bond. And actually, these have been shown to be able to be hydrolyzed and break down to free BPA. Work that we did in the lab actually showed that those uh, polycarbonate bottles, uh, both used and brand new, uh, resulted in the, the liberation of BPA and that there were neurotoxic actions related to this that were mediated through the same mechanism that estrogen works on developing neurons. And one of the major points uh, that has been highlighted uh, of the functions of estrogens during brain development is that endocrine disruptors that act like estrogens, uh, including bisphenol A, can alter brain structure, function, and development. Additional health effects, which we heard a, uh, an amazing public health talk uh, just prior to this, uh, so I won't go over the reproductive effects, uh, but there is also birth defects that can occur resulting from uh, endocrine disruption. There's direct effects on heart function, both um, developmentally as well as later in life, metabolic effects, disease, changes in horm hormonal level, as well as changes in the immune system and inflammatory responses. And of course, cancer, primarily breast and prostate cancer have been highlighted uh, yeah, in, with, 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 a, with a plethora of data. So we, you know, shortly after this was published, we, there was a, this, this large amount of marketing that was done about no BPA and BPA free. Uh, uh, products, uh, which takes care of BPA. But this slide here demonstrates that polycarbonate plastic such as this is a lot more than bisphenol A. There's flame retardants, uh, many of which are known to be toxic. There's phthalates, which was discussed previously. Um, alternate monomers have been introduced into this. And there's chemicals um, that, are, that are added as heat and UV protectants, as well as, of course, all the beautiful colors that we can see our plastic in. These are all chemicals with actually very little testing uh, for safety and the potential to be toxic, um, just as BPA has been found to be. In fact, the global chemical inventory was recently revised upwards to list at least 350,000 different chemicals. And what I thought was really uh, uh, interesting, um, over 150,000 of these were identifiable through CAS ID numbers, mixtures and polymers, which are generally thought to be, they're uh, poorly studied, um, and polymers and variable uh, chemicals of variable uh, 
um, structure um, are, are, are not studied very well at all for toxicity, but still 120,000 uh, of these were listed as unidentifiable chemicals within these inventories. And so this has really led to the, the, this, this career long often attempts at being science detectives. Uh, because of protections with confidential business information, um, colleagues of mine at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, as well as my laboratory and colleagues that I work with, spend much of our time identifying chemicals that are out in the environment but are protected by confidential business information uh, with little or no tox toxicological testing. There's also this phenomena called chemical whack-a-mole where for regulatory purposes, making small changes to a chemical that we would expect to have and has subsequently been proven to have very similar effects to say this phenyl A has to be tested again for toxicity, um, even with very small changes that we can show uh, very easily is expected to have the same effects um, on a variety of different organs and systems. So this leads me to my case study. And we're starting with a polymer uh, that has become quite important to us. It's, um, it's uh, a polymer uh, known to everyone called Teflon. It is a class of chemical that is a per, or in this case, per and polyfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS. Um, and PFAS really come on to public awareness through their contamination of primarily drinking water sources. And these are a very, very important uh, industrial chemical that is used in a variety of applications uh, due to the unique uh, properties of these PFAS molecules. Shown here is a map, a recent map from the Environmental Working Group shown primarily in blue drinking water sites that are contaminated with PFAS as well as military sites and sites that are fewer of these are unknown, the sources of these. And you'll see that a number of states have a very high density of dots. And this is primarily because states like Michigan and recently North Carolina, New Jersey, New Hampshire, through, uh, uh, through efforts, uh, Colorado as well as California, through efforts funded by state and the federal government have been testing water supplies um, to, to uh, once a problem has been, been detected in other drinking water supplies. An important thing to point out with PFAS, when these chemicals do enter the water supply, uh, current uh, water purification systems uh, do not easily remove them and it requires uh, typically now uh, a, a consumer uh, uh, led effort to have um, at your household water uh, purifying this. Although there are there is becoming uh, to be some very uh, expensive but very small efforts to put in uh, larger municipality purification systems. These PFAS largely known through only one chemical, uh, primarily PFOA, the effects are, 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 are very well documented because of contamination in West Virginia, but they include um, increased risk of thyroid disease, impacts on cholesterol, which of course has potential effects on other diseases, including heart disease. Uh, there is very importantly in this time of COVID, much evidence uh, for decreased uh, responses to vaccines or immunosuppression. There are impacts on fertility, uh, increases in blood pressure and preeclampsia, uh, elevated blood pressure uh, during pregnancy, and effects on birth weight that predispose uh, the children for later in life disease. In North Carolina, we have this uh, situation uh, on the Cape Fear River, which you can sort of see right there, um, that was discovered that the drinking water downstream in Wilmington, North Carolina, was contaminated with uh, production components of uh, floral ether uh, production uh, that was occurring upstream at this 
chemors plant uh, that is highlighted here due to direct discharge of uh, uh, PFAS components uh, into the Cape Fear River. But this creates our paradox. If we're moving to a zero emission economy, these PFAS in the form of these nafion membranes that are produced at this facility are absolutely an essential use component. They're the membranes that allow electrochemical and hydrogen fuel cells to function. And I'm showing here just a quick zoom in of these. These are these, these polymer molecules with these charged PFAS arms hanging off at the bottom that allows this electron flow and these, these hydrogen ions to, 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 to serve their role as these uh, polymer electrolyte membranes or PMEMs. So these are absolutely essential use, extremely valuable, will be extremely beneficial and for future development and, and arguably uh, um, something we absolutely need. However, in the production of these, we get these number of production byproducts that are unregulated. They have been uh, essentially because of their unregulated nature, uh, a free flow into the Cape Fear River resulting in quantitative uh, exposure of hum uh, humans downstream through their drinking water to these byproducts. One of these, the Snafion byproduct too, is proving to be extremely toxic uh, in, in, in ongoing studies. My group has actually seen the, nearly the same thing in wildlife that's living in these rivers where we're seeing about 80% of striped bass who are now essentially reproductively extinct in the Cape Fear River, um, having uh, very high amounts of these byproducts uh, in them. So we're impacting both our environment and our people downstream of this. So I, you know, this tends to be very dark, but there are things that we can do. And I wanna throw out a few just for discussion. Um, one of these, we can use this greater societal focus on essential uses of plastic rather than single usage. Um, we also need to ask ourselves a question. Should unregulated mean that you can just release it to the environment until somebody has to be a detective and come, come along and discover that it's having toxic effects on large populations? Um, are the things that we can do to stop protecting CBI more than we value our public and environmental health? Um, there's also things that we can do about conflict of interest. I would advocate for full and transparent conflict of interest reporting throughout the hazard and risk assessment, as well as the regulatory process. Um, we can also begin to not assume polymers are inert, but we can regulate them, including their precursors, and their byproducts uh, that result from production. And I would actually almost advocate for a very different testing realm. One that's very much uh, similar to our drug testing ones where we have a phase one through four testing with phase one being pre-production testing and phase four continued testing after during the life of the product with increasing safety testing rather than hazards identification for our risk assessment involved in this. And on those notes, um, thank you for your attention um, and be happy to take any questions when we're, when we're good to go. So to start, we have several questions uh, about various forms of exposure. So uh, the first of those, can plastic stored in vacuum sealed bags uh, leach into food stored in a freezer? Is that one route of getting uh, plastic exposure? So I don't know if um, Scott wants to answer, but I will. Um, so definitely food packaging, food uh, storage. Um, anytime you store your food in plastic, there's gonna be some leaching of that, whatever compound was used to make that plastic into your food. Many of these chemicals are not covalently bound to the actual plastic product and different temperatures and different conditions can result in leaching. Um, and I would consider that a source of exposure and you should minimize any type of contact with plastic in your kitchen and your food and your beverages. As much as possible, replace plastic with uh, other sources like glass, uh, stainless steel, um, wood in your kitchen for everything. 
be my, at least that's what I do. Um, you want to minimize your contact in any type, any time you, any time you prepare food, you want to minimize your contact with plastic end of story. That should be a rule of thumb. I don't know if Scott agrees with me, but. I, I agree completely. I would ask that, you know, cold frozen. Yes. We, and we showed a long time ago that heat's worse. So heating's going to be worse, cold frozen, slower, uh, but still uh, the food packaging material is a, is a is a recognized source of exposures the other thing is what you do with that plastic after you dethaw it and how long it stays in the dethawed condition and then what you do with it afterwards you put it in the microwave i mean minimizing your contact with plastic in any type of food contact is uh, really important i think it's a strategy to minimize your exposure overall I don't, think, I don't think we need absolute proof that it goes through. Just if you want to reduce your exposure, reduce your contact with plastic in your kitchen, in your food preparation, in your food production, in your food storage, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, then uh, the second route, now that we've covered food, don't mix food and plastic. Uh, how about our clothing? Uh, we, we've seen a bunch of campaigns about, you know, t-shirts made out of recycled plastic bags. You're doing good things for the environment. Uh, our second question is, can wearing clothing uh, made from synthetics and, and uh, as, especially the, the explicitly recycled plastics uh, affect our health? Uh, just from the wearing of them, the, the questioner wanted to be clear, not from the whole life cycle of the production, but is that a route of exposure? Well, I can throw out an example. <laughs> That's a great example. Well, nothing frightens me more than the thought of little children's shoes made out of recycled plastic where they put their little bare feet in there. And then there's transdermal exposure, transdermal exposure from the plastic into the child's foot. We haven't demonstrated it through direct science, but theoretically and practically, it makes sense that your child is sweating in that shoe, your child is running in that shoe, there's heat. Um, it's natural for whatever plastic is in that product will then transfer through transdermal you know, transdermal contact into the child's body through their, through their skin, into their bloodstream. Um, I would not put plastic clothes on my children or on myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so, since I kind of focused on additives and stuff, one of the great examples that I've seen, and I was actually initially very skeptical, the dyes used for denim was shown by a group in Denmark to break down and be metabolized into acetaminophen, uh, which can have endocrine disruptive properties. Um, yeah. There in, in Europe, it's called paracetamol. So, yeah. um, so there are components of your clothing that can transfer through transdermal uh, absorption. And uh, Scott brought up a really great example about PFOA and PFOS, which have been um, since phased out, but replacements PFAS replacements, which are used as UV barriers on clothing. Um, and that has become a, a huge industry as UV clothing has become all the rage in the last year or two, where you buy anything that's either UV, you know, UV ray protected or um, waterproof. Um, and these, to make those products waterproof or UV proof, they are infused with PFAS chemicals, so perfluorinated chemicals to be able to make them um, waterproof, stain resist, you know, stain resistant shirts, wrinkle proof shirts. To get those products to have those features, chemicals are added into that product to, to allow them to have those sellable, marketable features. And we know that when you put clothing on your skin, especially if you're sweating or working out, because a lot of these, a lot of these uh, clothing are for, you know, for athletic wear, that type of thing. Um, Again, we don't have direct studies to show that it's it's you know that this particular product results in a higher concentration in the human body, but theoretically, wearing that, sweating in it, you know that there's going to be some some of that chemical that transfers through your skin into your body, and this is why we find 99.9% .9 of the population have one or more of these compounds um, in their serum or in their urine, depending on what you're looking at in terms of chemicals. So again, I don't, I personally don't wear any of these types of products. <laughs> nor do my children, um, but you know. And okay. we should stop beating up on clothing. We could make, we could keep going. <laughs>
Uh. Yeah, well, I, I think the point's been made. Uh, you know, stick to the organic clothing and uh, no plastics in your food. So I, I'll throw out one more of these and then we'll we'll progress to other subjects. Uh, but uh, one uh, attendee wants to know, so uh, silicon storage, food storage is now being touted as a safe replacement for plastics uh, is is that true or are there things we should be worried with these uh, silicone replacements as well that's a bit out of my wheelhouse I've always been modestly concerned um, on a couple of levels one I don't know what's in it and I have no way of finding out and secondly, silicone also takes up a lot of things. They're used as mon wearable monitors to check chemical exposure. Um, so my assumption, and it's just that, is that over time, these are going to be taking up chemicals, whether and how quickly they can transfer them to other things. I, it, it's, it's beyond my, my expertise. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in the same position as Scott on this one, silicone. Um, when silicone's made, it's made with dyes. It's made with many, many other things. It's not pure silicone. I mean, a lot of these plastic products in the home in, around cooking and stuff like sous vide things are all made in silicone. You know, it's not just pure. And the manufacturing of any of these products results in exposure to many, many different phases of this production of this product. Um, and anytime you put anything plastic with heat, I'm a no-no for it. So I do not, again, have any plastic like that in my home. I don't know if there's evidence for it. It's out of my wheelhouse. I don't, I don't know what's in it. I don't know how it transfers through. But as a general rule of thumb, plastic and food don't mix. And you're making me very glad that my water bottle is glass. Um. <laughs> That I, I thought to raise might be of interest is something that we've been studying a little bit more carefully in the last year or two is looking at feminine hygiene products and, and the exposure to phthalates and other kinds of chemicals like dioxins and other things, even perfluorinated chemicals in feminine hygiene products, including tampons and pads, and even things like children's uh, diapers and things that you put on a baby and an infant. And again, these are things that have received very little scrutiny, very little attention from both the media point of view as well as the research point of view, but there is an increasing interest from scientific point of view to to look at this and a recent paper was published this year actually I guess it was 2020 um, that found um, feminine hygiene products have phthalates DHP specifically and other chemicals in these products that you put inside a woman's body and a study that I conducted looked at um, ultrasound gel that you use on a woman's body when she goes for an ultrasound during pregnancy that that gel has um, several chemicals in it, including DHP and parabens um, that gets transdermally absorbed we saw increasing concentrations of women following ultrasound in her urine so another potential source that we haven't considered the right. transmucosal absorption through the vaginal wall is, is a concern for women that use these products and for women, people like me who study them in the reproductive cycle, so. Okay, I, a question from the other end of all of this. Um, uh, Dr. Belcher, you mentioned the PFASs, which have gotten the, the label forever chemicals. So one of our questions is, if you cut down your exposure, will your body get rid of these or are you stuck with them forever? That depends. I mentioned that there's eight thousands of, of these. Um, there's been a recent push towards using um, uh, with, with, with marginal evidence, short chain PFAS, which are supposed to be eliminated very, very quickly. But then again, we run into this this same problem of continuous ubiquitous exposure where we're constantly exposed and re-exposed. So once they're in the body, some of them stay, some of them are eliminated. What our relative exposure is, 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 is it depends on the chemical and we really only know something from less than 20 of the 8,000. So um, I would say what I, I'm a little, when Forever Chemical started, I was a little uncomfortable with that because that immediately leads people to believe that it, it's in my body. It's always in my body. It, 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 it's a good it's a good hook. These are persistent. These are uh, potentially some of the most, uh, in my opinion, dangerous chemicals that we've dealt with in the industrial 
period that we, we're all living in. I agree with Scott on that point as well. Um, PFAS, is, you know, the forever chemicals, these PFAS chemicals um, have escaped scrutiny for a long time, but suddenly they're now in the forefront from both a uh, scientific research point of view, from the NIH's funding point of view, from a regulatory point of view. Um, they concern us gravely. We know very little about, about their effects. Uh, I just received a large R01 study to look at the reproductive effects of these chemicals in men and women and how they impact fertility, pregnancy, and child health. Um, we only know about a handful, as Scott mentioned, and we don't know about the thousands of others that are in circulation and production constantly. Um, and um, they have a long half-life in the human body from two to 10 years. So once you're exposed, it, it is hard to reduce your exposure. So if I change my behavior today, we may not, you know, I won't see an impact of what's in my body from my current exposure, but I'll reduce future exposure, which is what you want to aim for, because you can't really do anything about what's happened to you over the last five years of exposure. That said, there are, you know, there are some studies, um, very, very recent, including one of my own with a colleague from URI, looking at things like fruit juice consumption, certain types of nu nutrient exposure that can reduce your, we find correlations using NHANES data that we're going to be submitting for an abstract at the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology Conference, looking at in NHANES, which is National Health and Nutrition Survey of the United States, higher levels of these PFAS, sorry, higher concentrations of things like juice consumption reduces your PFAS exposure, reduces concentrations in, your, in the human body. We mimic this based on some animal studies that my friend, uh, my colleague did at the University of Rhode Island, um, looking at in the animals when they had higher doses of things like apple juice and orange juice in these rats, they found lower concentrations in different tissue of certain PFAS. Um, so there might be with future research and more intervention based research opportunities to reduce exposure through different types of nutrient um, um, and dietary interventions. In addition, bleeding, including menstrual bleeding monthly can reduce your overall burden over time. So women have slightly lesser concentrations of these chemicals in the human body because we know that these PFAS are attached to red blood cells. And so they can be eliminated through loss of blood. Or if you wanted to go donate blood, you might be able to get rid of some of your exposure, but there's very little you can do for past exposure. More importantly, you need to look at future exposure and limiting your contact to things like Teflon products, stain resistant products, carpets that are stain proof, oil proof, food packaging such as I mean, all food packaging in, in, um, in fast food chains, um, all of these, you know, Burger King or wherever you go, you have these, these nice papers that allow no grease to go through, no oil to go through. And those papers and packagings and Chinese takeout are coated in things like PFAS chemicals, one of those 8,000 that Scott mentioned. And we don't know how they harm our health, but we're pretty certain that there's some significant harm to our health and we need more research to be able to know specifically what th that harm looks like. From a regulatory point of view, um, you know, regulating the chemical class is something that we are pushing for from an epidemiological point of view and people who are trying to inform policy is that regulating the class is the way of the future in terms of being able to manage this issue, both from phthalates or phenols or PFAS that or flame retardants, I was on a National Academies of Science panel that we recommended a class-based approach because trying to stop one chemical at a time creates this whack-a-mole effect that, uh, that Scott mentioned that then companies just start producing and replacing that with a different version of it like BPS or BPF, um, which we now see BPF and BPS is actually more harmful from a reproductive point of view than BPA was. So your BPA free product might be more harmful than your BPA product. So I don't buy BPA free anything ever um, because I don't know what the other replacement is and I don't have too much trust in the chemical industry in protecting my health. And so that's the approach that you take. And I think, I don't know if this talk happened yet, but the minimalist approach in your environment is definitely the way to go. So we can't control everything, but we can control what we put in our space and what we consume. And these are places where we have the most power to intervene from a bottom up approach. If the government agencies are not gonna regulate things, we can try to you know, impact our environment by choosing to purchase less first, buy fewer things in your space, eat less processed stuff, use natural ingredients as much as possible, less processed foods, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the types of strategies. And use wood and glass and plastic, natural things that um, allow you to minimize contact in your environment. Because even the dust, things that break down in your home, 
the dust, your child goes and walks on the floor and then licks its hand or picks up an apple or a piece of cheese and the child has dust all over its hands. Um, and the dust is coming from, you know, even things like electrical wiring and the breakdown of things in your home. So minimize items in your home is my go-to message. <laughs> I'm a minimalist myself. So um, yeah, buy as little things as you can. Okay. Uh, Dr. Belcher, do you want to chime in? I can enthusiastically endorse everything that was just said. Um, the other thing that I would add, I would also add, you know, this idea that I tried to point out that having to go back and look back in history is so difficult. And the, the, and the concept that toxic compounds, toxic chemicals, toxic plastics that are breaking down into other plastics are out in the environment. And we have to assume that those chemicals are safe until we can prove, which we cannot do with science, something's guilty. Uh, we've, we've had to go back to the end with our, with, our, with our PFAS chemicals, which we're having difficulty, you know, we, we know that there's been exposure from this source since the 1980s, but we're having a hard time. We, my lab has decided to go as far as to look at alligators who have been living in this water who are long lived to see the, the health effects and are seeing some very dramatic health effects um, that uh, are, are frankly shocking because related to these exposures, uh, including um, um, autoimmune disease in, in something like an alligator that should never have autoimmune disease or has never been documented to have autoimmune disease. Yeah. All right. Well, both of you now have mentioned uh, the regulatory aspects, and this is a law school program, so we should probably talk a little bit about regulator regulation. Um, Dr. Masurlian, you mentioned, you know, we should be able to do these as classes of chemicals. Uh, one of our questioners pointed out current law requires a, a chemical by chemical approach and often an exposure pathway by exposure pathway approach. Uh, the United States' regulation of commercial chemicals through the Toxic Substances Control Act has been criticized multiple times for uh, having the reverse of a precautionary approach, which Dr. Belcher mentioned that we presume things thrown out there in, in commercial use are safe until someone proves otherwise. Uh, which uh, we've had a few questions about how hard that is to prove otherwise. Um, would you uh, go even further, and I, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but advocating for uh, a reversal in that approach of um, maybe we need a more precautionary approach, or are there just too many things out there at this point and we need to find a better way, and if so, do you have other suggestions for a better way, either scientifically or as a matter of legal regulation? I know that's a lot, but what, if, if you were in charge of the world, how would you change how we deal with these chemicals, I guess, would be the summation of that question. Would you like me to- Do you want to go first or you want me to jump in? <laughs> I, 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 can, I can Labrador right in. So I would advocate very strongly for a precautionary approach. I would take a very close look at um, the EU's uh, uh, new approach to chemical regulation. Um, it, it, it's not perfect, but it's certainly better. Uh, we must begin to regulate on a class based approach. Um, and, um, you know, I threw it out there, not fully just to be provocative, but additional safety testing. The reality is that there is no chemical, cosmetics, chemicals, plastics, that has been proven to be safe. It's not tested for safety. The other point I think you asked about, um, oh God, I just blanked. Um, you asked about how easy it is to prove something is harmful. We can't, science doesn't work that way. That creates misinformation. There's a big effort in the United Nations right now to improve science literacy. Science 
and access to science and the benefits of science is a fundamental human right. Part of that, in my opinion, would be to not allow in a meaningful way um, science misinformation being posed by so-called experts to just muddy the waters and create de delaying tactics. Um, so now that I'm in deep <laughs> over my neck, um, <laughs> Carmen. No, that was like words of perfection in my opinion. That was the best answer provided possible. That was amazing and I agree with everything you said. Yeah, very well said in fact. Okay. No, I, I, I actually really mean that. <laughs> not just trying to escape my own answer. Um, I do agree with everything that Scott just said uh, wholeheartedly. Class-based approach is really, really important. There's no safe chemical, end of story. We need new approaches. The European Union does have an, an interesting model that I think we could, um, you know, that we could try to move towards in the United States. I think it's much more complicated in the United States because of the corporate interests and the, the pressures and the, the lobbying that happens from chemical corporations into the government system. It's so complex that we that we put human health last, unfortunately. We make corporate interests first in these kinds of decisions. And I think that history has harmed us. Um, I think that we haven't protected the public's health at all, especially children's health and women's health and uh, vulnerable populations health. And it's to the detriment of our population, to our population health, to our public health. And we're now just going backwards. We're trying to figure out where these harms are coming from and why are we seeing these increases risks, increased risks of, in my case, in the work that I do, fertility, pregnancy, and child health outcomes, neurological outcomes, fertility issues, um, preterm birth, pregnancy loss. Um, and we're nowhere near finding the answers that we need. And we will need a million more scientists to be able to determine the science that's needed. And what Scott mentioned, which I think is really important is that we don't want our science being messed up by public opinion, by public interpreters of this. We want our science to be used whole and in a, in a, in a sacred way that's really not confounded by public opinion and other types of politicalized, politicized, um, viewpoints that just muddies the water, which is what Scott said. It does muddy the water, and I think it complicates things. And um, working together with industry, I think, should be an area that we explore further, that I think that industry needs to be more accountable, that they need to be held accountable, that they need to be pressured and incentivized to produce chemicals that are safe, that they do the work to determine the safety before the pre, what Scott had mentioned earlier, which is the pre- uh, production phased testing has to come from the companies, from the industries. They need to show us that these are green chemicals or safe chemicals, that there's no impact to human health or to the environment, or at least reduced harm to human health and the environment. And all that should be paid for by the industry that's profiting from selling these chemicals widely across the globe. And um, I think that's, we need to put the incentive and the pressure back up to the producers of these chemicals. There's only so much a scientist can do with the NIH funds that we get to be able to show this stuff. And it's frustrating, very frustrating from a scientific point of view. Um, our power is limited. The best I can do is inform the population, the public, the doctors that I work with, um, try to develop interventions that I'm now testing in an RC, you know, in randomized uh, control trials, interventions on couples to reduce exposure to see if it improves their outcomes. That's as much as I can do. Go and work on National Academies of Sciences and try to advocate for, you know, as strong as I can around, I did that for flame retardants. Um, we have limited power. The power is in the hands of people we vote for and the companies that get paid billions and billions of dollars to sell these chemicals. And so... I'd say go up if you can. <laughs> um, so now that I've you know, overstepped my per personal opinion, that was all personal. Harvard has nothing to do with it. So, um, I'll stop there. All right, well, um, since both of you have mentioned the, the use and abuse of science, we did have a question on uh, acknowledging that many of the studies you mentioned and cited and participated in are peer reviewed, have been published. Um, how broadly accepted are these findings that plastics harm human health? Is, is there a, a debate in the field or is this widely accepted as, um, I, I realize established fact is not a, a phrase scientists like very often, but uh, 
confident enough that there's not room for a, a whole lot more debate on that. So observational data is, the, is really all we have from an epidemiological point of view. So from a human point of view, causal, causality is difficult to prove. Um, what we look at is the body of evidence and the synthesis of the body of evidence and the accumulation of science over time that's triangulated with toxicological and experimental data with human data. And when we do that, when we look at the epidemiological data triangulated with toxicological and experimental data, we see that certain chemicals are bad actors, have shown to be bad actors in all three domains, experimental, toxicological, and human. And while the observe because we can't go and you know do RCTs, do randomized trials and go, hey, you get high exposure, you get low exposure, let's see what right. happens in pregnancy. Do you have a, you know a fetal loss? Do you have pregnancy loss, whatever. We can't do that. So we rely on observational data, epidemiological data that's prone to some error, definitely. There's there's some error in that we can't essentially prove causality. It's not like we treat an animal with and without, we compare, but we have a body of evidence now. We have an accumulation of evidence and certain patterns that emerge that are very, very consistent. And that's one of the causal criteria is the consistency of the findings, the, the accumulation of the findings, the triangulation with toxicology for mechanism. And when we look at that, we do find that phthalates, for example, we know they're reprotoxicants. We know they're immunotoxicants. We know they're epigenetic toxicants. We have the data to say that. Same thing with perfluorinated chemicals. We have data to show that some of those perfluorinated chemicals are very harmful. Um, we don't have the data for everything because we don't have enough money and time to study every single chemical. <laughs> Scott, correct. And we, don't, yeah. and we don't know what every chemical is. Okay. And that's part of it. And that, that, that was the last thing that I would add to the, the previous question too, is this default idea that if a manufacturer says something is CBI, you have this full firewall of CBI, regardless. And that 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 standard is, is not, it's basically if you say it, you get CBI. And we're guessing. And it's careers of sciences, scientists that are a commitment to figuring out what things are. And maybe they're doing something. No, it's generations of scientists. And that confidential business uh, claim comes up in a lot of contexts where people wish it didn't like hydraulic fracturing fluids and things like that. So it's a, it's a big uh, legal issue. Well, okay, we are down to our last two minutes. So I'm going to give each of you uh, perhaps 60 seconds uh, to give one last take home message uh, I, to our audience. I realize there are a lot of questions. I think most of them have been more or less covered in uh, our very eloquent answers, but I wanna give each of our panelists about 60 seconds to give one last take home message for our audience. And thank you for being here at our symposium. Dr. Well, Belcher, you want to go first? I'll it. <laughs> I, mine's, mine's higher level. Um, you know, science heart, biology's complex, doubt is easy. Um, so, you know, if if, uh, if we can do do one thing, we can do a better job as a, a society um, to uh, uh, embrace science. I love that. I second that. That is. <laughs> Science rocks, and we should trust scientists more. I agree with that as the, as the take-home message. I want to leave one take-home message, which is really, I mean, it's daunting and exhaustive and um, overwhelming to look at the science from the public's point of view, from a layperson's point of view, from a person who's not a scientist's point of view, to see you know the headlines and to be aware of the possible harms to your baby, to your child, to your unborn fetus, to your future pregnancy. Now, we didn't even talk about transgenerational effects, so if the baby that I carried in my tummy, if she was a female, her babies would be affected by my exposure, my mom's exposure, like that kind of stuff we didn't even touch. What I want to say is that it is overwhelming. Um, but you do have some impact on your own health. And I know this is a, an issue that's more, you know, we have more control when we're higher, you know, more educated, have more resources. But I think each and every one of us, each and every one of us has a choice as a consumer. And that's where you have the power. And if my key message is anything, is as a consumer, you have tremendous power. Educate your children to be 
sound consumers of products of things, not only just things in our environment, but anything, including messages on the news in, in, in our society, in mainstream media, be a critical consumer, a, 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 a critical consumer and a questionable consumer that selectively chooses what to be exposed to, both your mind, body, and spirit, what is, is it, what it, what it is exposed to. And I think if you could teach your child that to be cautious and careful with what you buy and what you consume um, and try to stay as close to nature as you possibly can would be the way to go. So be a, be a critical consumer and what you expose your body, mind, and spirit to is really important. And that's where we have control. So focus on that. I'm going to add one more thing to that because I think that's perfect, perfectly well said. However, I would ask that this should not be a question of economic status. This should be available and uh, accessible to uh, regardless of your, your ability to pay for it. So it should not be a consumer cost for yes, safety. I agree with you on that 100 percent because we do know that there's gradients of, of exposure, socioeconomic gradients of exposure. So, uh, you know, there's more risk among certain groups of people. And that's because there's, you know, less control over certain things of what you're exposed to. So, um, yeah, we, we, we want to make it equitable as possible if we can. And that's a future that I dream of for my children. And I'm sure others do as well. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are at the end of our time for this very lively uh, conversation. I want to thank again, Dr. Belcher, uh, Dr. Masurlian for participating in this panel on plastics and health uh, and for being part of our symposium. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Bob Kiter, to close out the day. Thank you both very much. And let me add my thanks uh, to both of you uh, and to you, Robin, uh, for this uh, extraordinarily informative uh, session <clears throat> to end the day on. Uh, I think we're going to pick up on the consumerism uh, theme uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so to conclude things, let me thank uh, the folks in the audience for joining us, uh, attending uh, today's uh, uh, opening uh, day of the 26th annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium. Let me uh, thank uh, all of our uh, esteemed speakers. Let me thank uh, all of my colleagues uh, who have participated both on the front line and the back line in the presentation of the uh, symposium. A special thanks to my colleague, Bob Adler, who uh, really steered the ship in pulling uh, this uh, symposium together for us. Uh, tomorrow, uh, please join us at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, we'll begin uh, tomorrow's program with a presentation by this year's uh, Stegner lecturer, Joshua Becker. Uh, he's the best-selling author of the founder of Becoming Minimalist. Uh, he will discuss overcoming consumerism for a better you and a better planet. His presentation will then be followed by panel discussions on solutions uh, at uh, the global, national, local, and individual level. So we'll build upon much of what we've heard uh, today. Uh, if you're not able to join us uh, tomorrow, uh, please take a moment to fill out the online evaluation uh, that's located under the evaluation tab on the left side bar of the symposium homepage in WOVA. Uh, let me uh, also uh, conclude then uh, by again thanking our principal funders and sponsors. Uh, that would be as principal funders, the R. Harold Burton Foundation, actually the founding donor for uh, our uh, annual symposium. Uh, and the Cultural Vision Fund, uh, which likewise has been a consistent sponsor of the Stegner Center Symposiums. Uh, in addition, uh, our sponsors include the SJ and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, the Nature Conservancy in Utah, and the Student Natural Resources Law Forum here at the University of Utah College of Law. And with that, uh, thank you everyone again for a very productive day. I hope you enjoy the remainder of the afternoon or evening, depending on which coast uh, you're located on. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.